today's episode of Be Freaking Awesome. I'm one of your hosts, Sammy Kinnison, here with Angela Belford. And today we are here with very special guest, Gary Ware. Before, Gary, we give you a chance to introduce yourself. Angela, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you know Gary and uh, give us a little setup for him. Yep, we're going to keep going with the World Domination Summit Love, which we explained last week when we had Mike on the podcast. So, but I learned something new when I was reading Gary's book in prep for this. And that is, I didn't know, Gary, you were the person behind the Brave Bots. So when I went to my very first WDS back in 2014, Barry and I got a little Brave. I think it was the 2014. If you're like, no, Angela, I did that in 18. Tell me, feel free. But Barry and I got a, a little Brave Bot. And we just knew some guy handed it out, but we had no, I don't know, we were new to the whole community. And so then when I'm reading in the book that you're the one, and I was like, oh my gosh, I, I mean, I knew him for a long, long time. I just didn't know. I thought I knew you because you were, I went to a couple of uh, workshops that you and Ange, uh, Amy Angel Lilly did, which episode 26, we talked about improv with Amy. And so I'm super excited to have you here talking about your new book. Yes. And, and I have to do a slight correction. I didn't invent the Brave Bots. The other Gary, Gary Hirsch, did. And then oh. he told me to steal the idea. And so I've been passing them out as well. In okay. 2014, that was my first WDS as well. And that's where I first got them. Okay. And that's where I first met Gary. We get confused. Yeah. People confuse us all the time because our the names are Gary. Gary. Yeah. Uh, so I I, I want to just perfect. Uh, put the record perfect, straight perfect. that Gary Hirsch invented them. And as a true improviser, he encourages and invites everyone to steal his idea. And I have been passing them out, uh, making my own and passing them out um, to spread joy. So, yes. And, That's fantastic. Yeah. And then about me, because uh, you asked me to say that. Um, yeah. I, um, as you mentioned, I'm an improviser. Uh, if you really knew me, you would know that uh, I'm a, a father of, of two beautiful sons. Um, I love to play, which I'm pretty sure we will talk about that. Um, also, uh, neurodivergent with ADHD. And um, yeah, I run a small company called Breakthrough Play. And, and we use playful methods to help people um, just make their lives more better. And today you're here talking to us about... My book, The Playful Rebellion. Yay! Woo! Love it. I love it. I and have so I have many been, questions and so many observations. I have been listening to this book throughout this week and I love all the references. I felt like I was just here for it. Like you first mentioned Hook and I was in my car listening to the audiobook and I was just like, Rufio, Rufio, Rufio. And then you brought up, <laughs> let me be your Rufio. And I was like, okay, that sounds great. I was already here for it. Just going, going all in. So I'm really excited to talk about this and even just I think specifically play at work is such a fun topic and I mean I didn't mean to use that as a pun but I guess it was um I, it's so it feels so hard to think about when in all of our jobs in our work I actually even last night was on the phone with a friend who was lamenting to me how do I balance my ambitious self with my carefree self who loves to have fun and she's in this real existential crisis about how do I basically, how do I have fun at work and how do I engage in this life? And so I think that the conversation is more timely than ever with everything going on and all of the things. So why not just double down on adding fun into your life? So I'm super excited. I think this is great. Yeah. Angela, do you want to kick us off? I know you have a more yes. organized list of questions. Heck yeah, I do. I do, man. I got organized for this one because I was like, okay, we're going to have a podcast about fun with three people that have ADHD confirmed. So I got to be organized. So <laughs> first thing that I noticed that I thought was brilliant is you said, I would go from seeing the world as a playground to seeing the world as a proving ground. I mean, mic drop. Tell us more about that. Yes. So um, I have this belief and it's not just me. It, it's proven by data that as kids, we are perfect just the way that we are. Uh, kids are extremely playful. Uh, kids, matter of fact, there's uh, research from NASA that show that kids around, especially around age five, have genius levels of creativity. But then as we get older, there are so many things that cause us to lose our spark and, and our zest for life and that childlike wonder. And... And in the book, I mentioned that every job that I start, 
I'm super excited about it. I'm super excited. I, I see the work is play. I jump in it head first, but then something happens over time where I start to, you know, see, instead of seeing the world as a playground of possibilities, which it should be seen, I see it as a proving ground. And when I mean by proving ground, like proving to myself that I'm worthy, proving that I'm good enough. And I learned this through a mentor of mine. Her name is Gwen Gordon. Um, she said that when you see the world as a proving ground, you see the people around you as potential competitors, as people that are trying to like sort of take your spot and you will act accordingly. You know, you will, you know, start acting, you know, with this sort of scarcity mindset. Uh, you may overwork. And that's one of the things that I did. I found myself burning myself out over and over again. And you may be thinking, well, Gary, you know, aren't you supposed to work hard? Uh, aren't you supposed to? Yes, I totally get it. Um, it's just, it's like, uh, I like to use the analogy. It's like running a marathon with 10 pound weights on your leg. Yeah, you will finish, but you, you may be kind of, uh, you know, hurting by the end. Well, and you, you know, in my book, I talk about that my book is for people who heard a lot, uh, quit crying or I'll give you something to cry about. You use a phrase that I'm sure a lot of us have heard growing up, which is you can play after your work is done. And I mean, that resonated so deep with me because that was like, you got to get home and get your homework done. And then you're allowed to go out and play, which I always thought was kind of dumb, especially in the wintertime when it's like, but there's only so much play. There's only so much daylight. But I love how you talk about bringing that into adulthood and that we get stuck in that mindset in adulthood. It's very binary thinking, first one, then the other. And I'm going to let you use your quote, but you said the opposite of play isn't working. What is the opposite of play? It's depression. <laughs> and uh, that uh, was from Robert Sutton Smith. Uh, and, and once I heard that quote, the lights like came on. Because I understand why my dad said it. Again, uh, I grew up in the 80s. Uh, I wasn't diagnosed with the ADHD until I was in my 20s. Uh, my parents didn't know what to do with me. <laughs> they were like, this, this, this kid's bouncing off the walls. It gave me structure, and it gave me something that I was excited for because I wanted to play. And so it helped me focus so I can get the work done. Totally get it. However, that mindset stuck with me, and I feel like, a number of folks can relate to that. You can only play when the work is done. Here's the thing. As adults, being adults, adulting, going to work, the work is never done. Amen. So if you live by that mindset of you can only play when the work is done, you will never play. And I found myself doing that, of feeling guilty when I would have leisure time or do playful things because in the back of my mind, I was thinking, well, I don't deserve it. And that should mm. not be the case. We should not put that on ourselves that you don't deserve to play because uh, play is something that we all should do. It, it is in our DNA that we need to do. It's not something that you earn. It's something that is a human right. But again, you know, sometimes we, we hear something as a kid and it just sticks with us and we don't stop to like unpack it to find out like, what does it really mean? I think that's great. And I also think I, right now, I, Angela teases me about this, but my season of life, I just feel like I'm processing everything through the lens of my children. And I have a five-year-old and an almost two-year-old. And even thinking about when I was in elementary school, like whenever I would act up or th something was wrong, if I didn't do my work right, recess was one of the first things that would get taken away. We'd take play away. And sometimes that, that, that would build in this like, okay, well, you have to do things correctly in order to get play as a reward. And, and play as a reward where I think that it's probably really detrimental to take the kids that are being loud, have big outbursts, that can't sit still and say, you know what, that 30 minutes that you were going to get to go run around and burn all of your energy, instead you have to sit here and, and not do anything. And I'm like, honestly, teachers, you're making it harder on yourself for later. But how do we, we got to figure out how to rewire that in our brain, that even that, that perspective it's not a reward. It is a, it's a need that we have to fill within our weeks and our days. Yes. Yes. And if I can add one, uh, one thing to that, uh, there's a gentleman, his name is Dr. Stuart Brown. Uh, he, I like to say he wrote the book on play because that's the name of his book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how he got into it. He was researching a uh, serial killers 
and he found a link that between uh, a lot of uh, individuals that end up becoming serial killers, they did not have the necessary play when they were young, for whatever mm -hmm. reason. It was taken from them. Uh, you know, it, not like what you mentioned, like, oh, you were bad. It was like they were in situations where they, you know, yes, they didn't have love, but they, you know, they the play was stifled from them. And especially kids, kids need it because during play, you learn a lot of things. You learn boundaries. You learn what's uh, appro uh, appropriate and not appropriate uh, because kids throughout their, and I like to say even through adulthoods because we learn so much through play because when we're in a play-like state, our body, our brain thinks it's simulation, but the brain doesn't know the difference between dream and reality. So we're, we're simulating, but our brain is keeping track of these things. Um, and, and you're absolutely right that, especially the kids that, you know, have that uh, energy, they, they need to let it out. Um, and it was something, again, a lot of this thinking is outdated. It's interesting now, I'll give you this point. We, we have technology, right? We have phones and whatnot. I was just talking to someone just the other day and uh, he was talking about how he had uh, a laptop, uh, a, an Apple um, MacBook from 2017. And he was talking about how, oh, so outdated. I need to get the newest model. Uh, you know, we do that with our technology, but we don't do that with our thinking. You know, we don't mm. stop to think, you know, this this way of doing things. Yeah, it might have worked way back when, but does it serve us now? That's what I was going to say, is that there's so many times when I talk with people about like the things that we did when we were kids or that our parents did were in the name of safety and keeping us safe. Like, don't talk to strangers kept you safe. We needed that when we we're a little kid, right? But when you're an adult and you're feeling lonely and you continue to embrace the idea of I can't talk to strangers, stranger danger, then you end up like super lonely. And I'm like, it like understanding that you're letting programming of a seven-year-old run your life, you know? And that's kind of the same idea. And I'm thinking about it probably because of some weird work that I do. I do some, some DEI housing policy work. And we're really talking about like the work that we're doing in this policy work isn't gonna impact the people that are in public housing today, but it, the kids that are coming up this is a generational work and and the stuff that we're talking about with with how our brains work i mean i've used this example but bolby studied back in the 50s in britain it was very common if you were a little kid and you were in the hospital you went in the hospital and your parents visited you once a week we now know that's ludicrous but it's that same thinking that thought it was a good idea to take away recess Right. And so so why did we see that that's a bad idea, but we're not seeing that this is a bad idea? Well, I and then to that. just bring it from from high level into research into to, to the individual, to us here and listening in on this podcast, you can make a change uh, that will affect generations. And I think, Angela, one of the things that I think is really beautiful about you and I, mother, daughter, having this podcast as well, is that we can see the things that happened within your childhood to my childhood to then my son's childhood that he now like is just going to be set up so much better than either you or I ever were. And yet he will still have problems and he will still face things and he will still probably need therapy for ways that his mom screwed up. And I accept that. And that's okay. I hope it's new problems, not the same ones that we've been facing. I want him to have to, to, to not have to face the same thing over and over again and to give him a world where play is so normal. So how do we get there? Oh, so, wait, so, before we get a, there, I got, yeah, some go more, I got some more questions. Yeah, please. Okay. Ask the question. And then, and then, it's a journey. Stick around for the journey. Goes, Sit yes, down. I'm sorry, but there are some points that I want to make sure that we make here. Yes. That if people don't pick up the book, that I want them to hear these things. Number one is that we um, we were had a podcast where we were talking this month about the idea of whether or not fun makes learning easier or more effective. And I'm super happy because in your book, you say statistics show that creating a synapse in the brain takes 400 repetitions. However, by introducing play to the learning process, the number plummets to 20 repetitions. So in case you don't read the book, 
Play absolutely makes learning more effective, more efficient. And like, who can argue with 400 repetitions versus 20 repetitions? I don't know about you guys, but if you ever had to work on spelling words with your kids, yes, let's make it sound fun. So, yeah. so do you, I mean, you incorporate, you've got play workshops and you've got improv workshops. Talk about learning in those. Yeah. So um, the, the most people like they're shocked when they hear that stat. Yes. And I like to invite everyone to think about, has there been a time or do you know someone who had an in, uh, incident where uh, I'll use the negative. We don't have to go into detail with it, but like maybe something happened and maybe there was a food that they enjoyed and something happened. And then immediately they just like, I can't eat this anymore. Yes. I, I know I have. <laughs> I've had that. Uh, there is no sunshine after tequila. <laughs> right? I cannot have Jose Corvo tequila ever, ever, ever. again. I smell it. I, like it's, it's one of those things. And so it's very similar. When we play, we create what is called a peak emotional experience. We are engaging all of our senses and our brains, because we're in this heightened state, we learn things faster. We Things start to stick faster. Uh, because it would really suck if I had to take 420 shots of Jose Cuervo tequila to learn that this is not a good thing. <laughs> 20 is plenty. 20 is plenty. <laughs> One bad weekend in Mexico is enough to learn that I shouldn't do that. So, so I'm just going to put that out there. Well, just uh, yeah. So back to the work that I do. Uh, the the corporations you know that hire me they they want to help their employees uh, grow. Um, and the old way of doing that was you get a lecturer that's going to come in and talk about communication. They'll sit everyone down. They'll go through the whole spiel. This is what, uh, this is what assertive communication is. This is what aggressive communication is. This is how you're passive. Everyone's diligently taking notes. And then afterwards you, you do what you would do back in school. You take a test, you take that test. You pass it in. Yay, I got a certification. You get your thing. You put it on your, your wall. But guess what? In a month, uh, a few weeks from now, when you need to actually use the material you learn, you're not going to be able to recall it. There's a thing called a forgetting curve in that if you do not use uh, information that you just learned within, um, I think it's within 14 days, it will be as if you never learned it. However, mm. we are still... Still, again, talk about outdated uh, thinking. We are still using what we use in school because that's how we learn in school. You cram information in your brain. You take a test. You say you know it, and you move on to something else. I still don't know French. I took four years of French in high school. I know nothing. Uh, bonjour. That, that, that's it. Um, but I got good grades in French. I, I really did. Um, and so this is where, where I come in. I say, hey, look, do you want – your em employees to be effective or do you just want to say that they you know check the box and of course if a company is going to invest time money resources to this we want to make sure that it's something that they walk away now don't get me wrong there is there is something about like sitting down and going through topics totally get it and as we mentioned with play how can we get them to actually start embodying these behaviors and that's where i come in i bring in fun and entertaining uh, ways of playing with the material so that they are more likely to use it when it's time, um, you know, when the stakes are higher. So all of the things that we do is low stakes. We play these silly games that, to be honest, if you were to look at it on the surface, you're like, what does this mean? However, the cool thing is after we do this activity, we start to reflect, hey, you did this activity and you weren't able to recall the story that your partner was telling you. What do you, why do you think that is? Oh, because I was doing this, this, and this. Hmm, interesting. Is there a time at work when you were doing this, 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 and this, mm -hmm. and you weren't able to, like, recall what was going on? Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, I remember. I was in that Zoom meeting, and we were talking about some important stuff, but I had Slack open, and, uh, you know, I had my email over here, and I thought I was being effective by multitasking. Turns out I wasn't. Mm, all right, cool. So what are we going to do differently? You know, and, and you learned all of that through a game. And wow. it's very silly. It's it's very fun. And so that's what I love about the work that I do. So that's one area, the training area, um, you know, of the work to help people be more effective at what they do. We bring playful methods to do that. 
the other thing is the bonding part. And that's another great thing that play does. Play brings us together. Think about like growing up. When did we meet our friends? Yes, we were in the same class. We probably met them at recess. We probably <laughs> met them like, you know, playing sports. We met them um, during the times we were having fun together. That's awesome. I also think that we've had a couple of episodes about making friends as an adult and we talk about for kids, it's so easy to, it can be so easy to make friends because you walk up to somebody else and say, Hey, do you want to play with me? And they say yes or no. And then therefore your friendship is born. And now they're the best man in your wedding or whatever it might be. Like sometimes it's that simple. And yet as adults, we then are like, well, what am I supposed to do? I don't know how I'm supposed to make friends. If you invite people in to play with you, that is an easier way to make friends than to just be like, okay, well, I'm just going to go be near this person and we're just going to like talk together and do things. It's not to say that that won't work, but you will have to put more reps in of talking to them, engaging with them, getting to know them. 20. Right. Mm -hmm. And when you can move into, we're going to go do something fun together. Hey, do you want to go to the arcade together? Do you want to go play board games together? Do you want to go do something do something fun together. Let's go play. You actually, I think, can make friends a little bit easier as adults. It kind of can be as simple as kids seeking friends on the playground. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And if we want to open the hood, what happens is when we are playing together, doing an activity together, doing something that is pleasurable, having fun, uh, we are exhibiting in our brains the neurochemicals of dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. Those are the neurochemicals that help us bond. Uh, oxytocin um, is that feel-good hormone, uh, you know, that we get uh, around babies, uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and it helps us, um, you know, like really like love something. Uh, serotonin helps us trust each other. Uh, dopamine and endorphins um, help reinforce that this is a good thing and helps us be creative. So all these things, I like to call the, the dose, D-O-S-E, that's the easiest way to remember it. That is the fastest way, uh, you know, to like, uh, improving relationships because the unconscious brain is saying, wow, this is a great experience and it's taking snapshots of everything that's happening. And then you're like, with this person, you're like, well, we had a great time together. I guess I like you, you know, and, then, <laughs> and, and you're, and you're starting to be bonded uh, together. Uh, okay. So yeah, that's, I know. And as adults, it can be way challenging. Um, and that's why it's a great thing to find out like, all right, what's something, you know, that you can explore, you know, like maybe you can go on, um, you know, uh, my middle sister, she loves to travel. And so she is all the time telling us like, oh, I'm going on this trip. She went to like, uh, I think she went solo trip to Italy, but it wasn't just by herself. She was with a group. She made some some really cool, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, connections there. Um, I tell people take an improv class. The yeah. people that I took my level one improv class, and I'm pretty sure, you know, Amy, um, your previous guest would vouch for this. The people that I met in that class, I am still like close, close friends with them. And it's mm -hmm. because for eight weeks, we spent two hours a week together doing some silly stuff. It was very, in, in the beginning, it was uncomfortable. But again, we were connecting, we were laughing. Um, and then we found ourselves like bonding. One of the things that I was a little bit surprised with the book is because it's this playful re re rebellion. I thought that it was going to be all like, just let's play and be silly. And you actually advocate for some very um, serious topics, I would say. One of them being rest. And I, when you put it like the way you did, you are like, it's funny, we don't usually let our phone batteries go all the way to zero before we charge them and they shut off. When we get close to them dying, we start panicking. Oh my gosh, I have to charge the battery. It's going to be drained. And we go like out of our way. And I was like, and, sh and then you said, we don't do this to our body. And it was a very good metaphor and like really um, stuck with me that we, so many people think that we just like play, they think we, they're supposed to earn rest. And they think that, oh no, I'm going after my goals. I shouldn't be, um, I shouldn't be resting. You have to like, I have to get permission to rest. I have to have earned it. I have to have done enough stuff, but yet we don't think that about our cell phone batteries. Right. I love that. The, yes. Go ahead, Sammy. Nope. Keep going. Oh, 
I was going to say, here's the other thing that you said that was a little bit serious. Sorry. I keep like talking about these things and I'll have good questions to, to it's do all good. them in, but to I'm it. loving them. Here's the other thing is that in Amy's ta- uh, in Amy's episode, um, we, at the end of the thing, we asked our guest, is there anything else? And Amy's the only person that has ever kicked it back to our, our previous co-host, my son. And, um, and she's like, what did you learn today, Josh? <laughs> and he was like, oh, well, I learned that I, I've i never heard of an improv mindset. And yet I was raised, and I think, in an improv mindset. So, because we talked about yes and, which is my one of my favorite, favorite improv concepts. Except Gary like goes, hang on. We're going to take it even one step further because in reality, you can't always yes and things. And I get pushback on this and they're, you know, yes anding kind of, you get in the slippery slope of a little toxic positivity, which I'm trying to, you know, overcome. But I love that you say that we accept and build. And so you accept what is happening and then you build on it to the next thing. And so it's not a denial of reality. It's actually accepting it is what it is. And it's accepting the, the, okay, this person just handed you all this stuff, all this emotion, all this feel, and, and I don't want to yes and their garbage that they just threw at me, but I can step aside, let it keep going. And then I can say, okay, now we're going to build, we're going to move on. And I absolutely, I would love to know where you, how you kind of took that yes and, and like. I've never heard anybody want yeah. the yes and. This is the next level. So it is. So uh, level one of yes and is is saying yes of like yes yes because far too often as um, you know Amy often talks about is that we're we're no everything's a no we do it for various reasons either for safety or whatever so getting folks to just be open to possibility and saying yes cha ching however. There is that sort of pendulum where we say yes too much, and that is the toxic positivity. We, when we really mean no, and then by saying yes, we're saying no to something else. We're denying something else. And so, when I really like, uh, I was studying like, what does yes and mean? Like, why are we telling people to say yes? And in uh, teaching advanced improv, after a certain point, um, you know, we tell them you don't have to say the word yes to do yes and what and what it essentially means is that we accept. You said this, this is your offer that you're saying to me. I'm accepting it. I'm hearing you. Mm-hmm. And I'm offering, uh, you know, something to continue to build. So uh, couples, when I bring this up, like what I, what I do workshop and their couples in there, um, I give them this thing of, uh, because oftentimes, you know, one couple is like, I truly, I can't do this. But you know, I, I say yes because I, you know, I care about feelings and stuff like that. And I don't want to just say, or I just say no. But what it's telling the other person is you didn't hear me. And so um, as a way, like with a couple, if you're sort of like getting the situation, you can say, yes, I hear you. You want to go skydiving. You want to do this. Um, and are you open to another opportunity for us to connect together? <laughs> and so what, what that's doing is opening up um, you know, possibilities for other things to happen. Um, and so all yes and is it's accepting the reality and building on it. Another case in point is 2020. What we all know what happened in 2020. No one had that on their goal sheet of a global pandemic of things that they wanted <laughs> to overcome. That's the reality that we were in. So to yes and that we can accept this is what we're in right now. And how can we build? How can we keep going? Mm. Well, and I think, I so that. one of the questions that we are seeking to help people answer this year is how to live a freaking awesome life. And sometimes life is going to throw things your way that you can't control, that are sucky, that are just not ideal. How can we accept that and build upon that? How can we accept the life circumstance and add in the, the things that are still going to make it fun along the way, still things that are going to make it enjoyable, even when dealing with grief and with loss, that doesn't have to be devoid of fun or play. I think even 
hearing about when people have a big loss and they talk about all of the fun memories they had with somebody or, you know, my grandma was a part of a bowling league. And when she passed, we all went bowling together. Like things like that are a great way to, to honor, to hold space for that grief. It doesn't, fun doesn't always have to be happy. I don't know if that's a a weird thing to think Mm -hmm. about, but Great point. You can still be sad while having fun, especially when it's in that, like, I want to hold this this space for my grandma who loved this and have fun in her honor. What a great way to have fun in her honor, even if that makes you miss her. And even if that makes you a little bit sad that she's not there with you, you can still engage. I think that's also what's so beautiful about fun is that it's not um, dependent on whatever your emotion is. You can have happiness, sadness, anger, loss, grief, any, any type of emotion and fun can still be present. Yeah. That's so beautiful. I love this bridge because when I talk about accepting reality a lot, I'm like my drum that I'm beating is, you know, feeling your feelings and like allowing the emotions and, uh, and just even allowing the fact that your stomach is churning and you're sweating you can fight it, you can resist it, but it just makes it worse to try and shove all that down. And so I like really encourage people to, you know, to allow their emotions and to accept those, those sensations. And what I love is that in your book, you talk about the five regrets of people that are dying. And there's a great book that you quote of a, somebody that did palliative care. This is resonating with me because I spent a good chunk and everybody that knows that listens regularly knows that I spent a number of months of 2023 helping with some hospice situations and two different funerals. And I love this because one of the five regrets of dying is I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. And even in this yes, and in this accept and build and allowing that to me tied in so beautifully because we do have, we're, there are things that are going to make us mad. And there are things that happen in this world that kind of like, you would have to be dead inside for it not to make you mad. I mean, there's some, a lot of hard things in life. And so allowing those feelings, accepting those feelings, but then building on them, I accept the loss. And I've learned so much I can assure you that I've said after going through those two situations, like it's a little bit messed up my goal setting training because I'm like, you guys, in the end, none of this crap matters. You know what matters is relationships. And the way we build relationships is we have fun with one another. We rest with one another. We take care of one another and we, we, we work to, make this a priority and make people a priority. And so I love that the playbook has the five regrets of people dying and how we can just embrace feeling our feelings because that's what, what we worry about. I, even my aunt, there were several things that she was worried about that when we were talking about the end, did I tell this person enough that they had loved me? She had actually written a letter one of her daughters because she was afraid she had not told her enough that she loved her. And so in the midst of all of this play, you're telling me that we can still feel some negative feelings. Yes. For it. It's a duality. Uh, one of the things that I did learn uh, in my sort of study of improvisation and yes and is that two things can be true. We can know two things true at the same time. Uh, we can, and it's a perfect alignment of what you're talking about, Angela, of we can still hold grief and at the same time celebrate life. These two things can both be true uh, because oftentimes we we think of things in binary. It's either yes or, or no. Uh, but yeah, when you have a yes and mindset, you're like, oh yeah, I'm grieving right now and I'm gonna show up and I'm going to experience joy because I know that that's what they would love. Um, and one of the reasons why I titled my book, The Playful Rebellion, is that we are rebelling against the old way of thinking Mm -hmm. through play. We're using playful ways to like rewire ourselves because yeah, that way might've worked before. Um, You know, it might've had a purpose before, but is it serving us now? Um, I don't think so. 
Um, and in on the whole thing about like the regrets of the dying, the thing that really shook me up um, was, uh, and I talk about this in the book, uh, I lost a really good friend of mine. Uh, his name is Jed, um, lost him to cancer. And the thing that was so sad was that he was in remission for 10 years. He just had the 10 year anniversary and then it came back. Um, and the, but the thing I love about Jed, it was almost like his, his soul knew that like something was going to happen because yeah. leading up to that year, he had done like he, I was so proud of him. He got outside of his comfort zone and did so many things that he like was thinking about doing, but had never done. And that year leading up to that anniversary, like he had did solo travel by himself. Um, he started investing in things. He did all these things. And it was almost like he had this like sort of forethought, like I'm not going to be here much longer. And this is, this is the time. And so like, after we lost Jed, I was like, yeah, like, what is this all for? Um, mm. and, and at the same time, knowing all of that, like, this is the thing that is so messed up about our brains is that knowing all that our brains, because our brains, number one job is to keep us alive. So we have programs that go, wh whether we're thinking about it or not, I knew all this, but yet I still found myself going back to like overwork. I found myself going back to things that led to outcomes that I didn't like. And I was like, we like, I need a way to like change this. I'm like, I need to rebel against myself. And that's like where I got this sort of concept of like playful rebellion. Like, yes, I want to play, but I'm having a challenge playing, even though I read all the research. I'm like, no, I'm going to rebel playfully. <laughs> uh, and that's yeah, that's how it is. I think that's important to talk about because there are times where it's hard to play and, and like, we don't want to play. One of the things that I love about the last week's episode with Mike is that he talks about there are things we sometimes define fun so narrowly that we think, oh, I don't want to have fun. And I loved, he actually expounded it and it can be like anything that we enjoy. And so the play doesn't have to be going to an improv shop. It doesn't have to be going over the top. It can be small things. I mean, I like have taught my cat before I go to bed, I'll like get down on all fours and he like does this little weavy windy thing in and all over my, um, you know, my hands and the, and he'll meow at me and it just makes me laugh like crazy. It's the simplest, smallest little thing. And when I travel for long periods of time, it's the thing I miss is that just playing with my cat. And so it doesn't have to be this crazy over the top thing. This, you know, I, everybody that knows me knows I love to travel and yet this gives me joy every single day. Mm -hmm. I know listening to you guys talk about your kids those moments yes also. i mean we, we have kids around the same age so i, I feel you mm -hmm. i have a six-year-old and a 17 month old and and we're in it oh yeah and Super and fun. it can be i think that for me this season is about intensity because everything is felt so intensely and so when they're having fun it is intense fun and when we are in a good moment it is very intense when we're not in such a good moment it is also intense <laughs> and we deal with that as well. We ride the roller coaster. And, but I think that even the other day I was like trying to get my kids to school. They both go to Montessori school. And I was like, all right, we have to get ready. We have to get going. Like Henry, you have to focus. I need you to put your shoes on. And he's just doing whatever he wants, just really taking his time. And all morning long was this way. And I was like, I'm running late for work, buddy. We got to go to school. I need you. To, I was like, look at my eyes, look at my eyes. I need you to focus. And I need you to walk to the door. He goes, okay, mom. I will focus on hopping on one foot all the way to the door. I was like, okay, fine. Like, whatever. We're just going to play our way there. And we're just going to hop on one foot all the way to the door because that's what the world is. It's just a complete playground and of space for fun. And it's that reminder that like, okay, yes, we do need to keep going. There isn't harm in doing it in a fun way or in a silly way. Like we still got to school. I still got to work. And he had a lot more fun doing it than I did because he was looking for those opportunities. And it's, well, just, it's and always that blatant not, reminder in your face. I'm going to, I think you told that story. I want you to tell a different story. And that is that um, you were like, fuss, 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 fuss one day. And meh, 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 meh. And the next day, just this week, you were telling me, and I thought it was funny that we were having this whole, you know, we're recording our February fun episodes, but you were like, yep. I was still the same time late to work, 
But instead of fighting him, I just, we had a dance party. And so I just like put on loud music. And what's hilarious to me is that night, um, my husband went over to put the kids to bed because Sammy and I had an evening event. And um, Henry says, gee, when you and dad take me to school, I get there on time. But when mom takes me to school, we have a dance party. <laughs> and I was like, this is a pretty great way to be known by your kid. Right. Is like, oh, that's right. Uh, dad and she may be on time, but going to have a good time with mom. Oh, so. my God. That's so beautiful. And wait a yes and. Wait a yes and um, your your child. Uh, I, I get you. Because sometimes we're in that, like, the thick of it and, and we're we're mm -hmm. thinking on what we have to do and the kids such a great reminder uh send me a quick question do you watch uh uh the show bluey with your oh, oh my gosh yes <laughs> deeply obsessed we bluey on there this. needs to be an episode about that um only reason why i was going to mention that there is an episode that keeps coming to mind is the sticky gecko episode oh, and that just yes. reminded me of of what you were talking about yeah oh, that is a hundred percent this one yeah, it's uh, basically the kids, they're trying to get out the door to go to the park and taking, you know, like, oh, well, first I've got to, uh, I need to eat a banana. I need to go brush my teeth. But like, hold on. And at the very beginning of the episode, the youngest throws the sticky gecko up on the roof. And then is like, we can't leave until I catch my sticky gecko. And she's like, okay, mom's like, I will catch the sticky gecko. You go brush your teeth. You go put your shoes on. I don't want to wear shoes. I want to wear roller skates. And it's like, great. Then she puts on her roller skates. She puts them on the wrong feet. It's just like one thing after another. And every time they're like, mom, the sticky gecko. Don't forget, you have to catch the sticky gecko. And she's like, you're right. Like, let me catch the sticky gecko. It's just, it's sort of this funny, like the kids are having a grand time. And mom is the one. I am that mom a lot. That's part of why I love Bluey so much, though, is that I see myself so much in the parents and the, the desire to be there for your kids and to play with your kids and to get on their level. And the reality sometimes that you are just frustrated and you just need 20 minutes where nobody touches you and nobody talks to you. And you have the New Year's Day episode where mom and dad are, air quotes, tired and can't play with the kids. So let's watch TV <laughs> instead. Um, and there's so much about it, though, that it's such a good model for adults playing with kids and that it doesn't have to be all the time. Cause I think that's one of the things that I hear a lot from just mom friends is like, I can't get on the floor for four hours and play with my kid. And so you don't have to, you can still play for 10 minutes and that will mean the world to your kid. Like I have actually done that where we set a timer and say, this 10 minutes is a hundred percent yours. You decide what everybody does in the room, period, the end. And when the 10 minutes is up, we have to go back to doing whatever we are doing. And golly, that 10 minutes is the best time that he has in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's okay that it ends. And anyway, so even if it feels like it's too big, it's too much to incorporate, you can add in five, 10 minutes. You can take five minutes of your day and read a book. You can take, you know, a couple of minutes to send some messages to your friends to say, hey, I love you and I miss you. And that can be a way to spark some, some conversations and some fun. And even if it's not specifically fun, just texting a friend, it's starting to add that, um, that good, I don't know, will out into the world. It can start it's to spark those toasting. things. Yeah. So it's yeah. achievable, yeah. even if it doesn't feel like it. You just got to start. Yeah. Start somewhere. And it's playful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're full of play. And that's what I mm. like to tell people. Um, you know, there's playing and there's being playful. Uh, and so how can we add the playful element to the things that we're doing? Because it adds that zest. It adds that sparkle that at the end of the day, <laughs> when we are all like beat up and, you know, it, it's our last day, like we can think back. And those are the things that we're going to remember, the things that like brought us joy, the things that had meaning. Um yeah, so why you know you know we're gonna think about yeah the time like when we had the dance party you know we're not gonna think about like the hundred other times when we were like serious and we had to do this so yeah and it again it it makes things more bearable uh, you know bringing it back to like you know play at work a lot of folks you know they ask me you know how do I incorporate this I'm like too accustomed to like finishing things and stuff like that and I said just like what you said five minutes and how can you take something 
And this is what I learned from Mary Poppins, you know, for every job that must be done, add an element of fun and snap, the job's a game. So how can you add playful uh, moments, you know, throughout your day? If you're sending an email, you know, there's nothing wrong with putting a little emoji in there or a GIF. Yes, you know, back in another time that might have seemed like not professional. However, you know, times have changed. You know, if you're starting a meeting, why not, instead of being all formal and getting down to business, one of my beliefs is connection over content. Why not spend two or three moments and connecting with the people there, um, you know, asking them like, you know, something interesting. Um, you're building that rapport, you know. So, yeah, I hear you. One thing that I did back in my corporate job to make things more fun, I worked as a grants administrator for a little while for a large uh, private foundation. And so we would have to be sending out grant letters. And especially end of the year time, things got really busy and really hectic. And so there was, we created a competition to see who could get the most of their grant letters out the fastest. And the prize was a $1 trophy from the dollar store that I still have. I have not worked at that job wow. for four or five years and I still keep my $1 trophy from, if you're watching the YouTube, you can see it right now. Um, I keep it on my desk because it was fun. And it, there was one year that my team won. I don't have lots of these. I, we did this several years, but I, we, I would know that December would be the time that we would actually have a competition to see who could do this. Every now and again, I would like the last couple of days of November be like, hold on, this grant letter doesn't need to go out November 30th. They can go out December 1st so it can count towards the competition. Um, but it was a way that it just made it way more engaging and way more entertaining. And it wasn't somebody breathing down your neck like, when are these letters going to get out? When is this job going to get done? Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. End of the year. We all have to rush. It was, okay, guys, how can we all pull together so that our team wins the trophy? And I mean... It's a it's a dumb trophy, frankly. Like it's it's super plastic. It was like I think five dollars for five of them for the team, and we loved it. And even you can find ways that the work itself can still happen. How can you add fun on top of it? And how can you add fun to support it? Even if your job feels super corporatey, like writing out contracts to send to people and getting those contracts back, like. It doesn't matter. I definitely convinced people to help me work faster. I was like, you guys got to help me work faster. I got to get this plastic trophy. And they're like, I'm in. How can I help you win your competition? And even though it means so little in the grand scheme of things. So there are ways that you can think about, think creatively, work with your team, try to get some buy-in to, to just make it a little bit more entertaining along the way. Because why not? Otherwise, you're just doing it and it's just boring and it gets done. Yeah. Can I add to that if you don't mind? Sure. I would love that. Um, yeah. So like, oh my God, the way that they set that up is textbook perfect because uh, there's an amazing book uh, by Dan Pink called Drive. And it talks about how to keep people um, engaged. Uh, Angela, you're, you're doing the fist bump. Yes. You, you read that book? I love, I love Dan Pink. Yeah. Oh, Dan Pink. Yeah. So Everything. he had mentioned, so the old way of doing things um, and it got people um, sort of, it worked because, again, as you clearly saw, like you were very engaged, you were very motivated to get that little trophy. Um, those things work for tedious jobs. If you want someone to like do tedious stuff, you need to add that. It, it gets us just going through. Um, it doesn't necessarily work uh, all the time for creative stuff, or it doesn't necessarily work for sales stuff because you probably heard this. You know, get your sales quota, um, and um, you know, and you get a prize. Well, guess what? Uh, because it works so well to hijack our brains. We oftentimes would do things that we normally wouldn't do. And then as a result, you're creating behavior that you don't want. But if you need something tedious done, like I can only imagine these grant letters being very tedious, like, to, you know, mm -hmm. and, and very time consuming. That's the perfect way to add that gamified element because it's going to hijack our brains. Like, again, that's why we are wired for play. Like we are just inherently like, <gasps> And you're right. Like when you like really break it down, it's it costs a dollar, like five dollars max for five trophies. Mm -hmm. But look at the cool, like how everyone was rallying together mm -hmm. to do this, you know. So yeah, I, I think that is just amazing. And and this the question is what else, what other tedious things that you hate doing 
that you can add a little bit of fun and and then now you get into the state of flow and then boom you blink you're like oh wow we we did that that's Mm -hmm. beautiful uh if you want to add some fun to your week i'm gonna highly recommend that you all follow gary ware on instagram because i love fridays even more than i used to love fridays because i love your friday fun day and half the time I send them to somebody like, ah, look at what today is, to somebody. So where else can people find you online, Gary? Yay. Well, as you mentioned, Angela, on Instagram, at Gary Ware. I'm on most of the socials. You just look for at Gary Ware. You'll, you'll, see, uh, you'll see my smiling face. Um, if you have a question about anything that you heard, I, I love talking about this stuff. Uh, you know, Reach out. I'm on LinkedIn. You can go to my website, breakthroughplay.com. I would love to to chat with you. Um, and yeah, that's where you can find me. People can also Thanks, buy your book. You didn't mention that. Yeah. They can also buy your book <laughs> online where <laughs> books are sold, I'm assuming. Thank yes. you so much, Debbie, for that. Yes, I, I have a book. We talked about it. The Play for Rebellion, How to Maximize Workplace Success Through the Power of Play. Uh, it is available at book places everywhere. You can find that also. Uh, playforrebellion.com. Uh, it goes to my website. Um, yeah, if, if you found this interesting, uh, you know, there's Audible version, there's Kindle version, there's actual analog paperback versions. I love it. I got the pre-order version. So was on the, uh, we authors got to stick together, right? Yes. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much. No, thank Appreciate you. That. Thank you. This has been really wonderful. And if you guys have learned something from this, share it with a friend. Tell somebody what you learned and where you learned it and uh, grow in play together. For now, we hope you guys have a great rest of your day and you go be freaking awesome.